Meet the Gao 8 Avenger. 3,900 bullets per minute. The Gao 8 Avenger isn't just a weapon, it's a symbol of immense firepower. Specifically designed for the A-10 Warthog, this fearsome rotary cannon is renowned for its devastating effectiveness against ground targets. With its distinctive sound and intimidating profile, the Gao-8 embodies air-to-ground dominance, striking fear into adversaries and providing crucial close air support to ground troops. Let's take a look at the awesome firepower of this gun. Well, first of all, it's big. Cast your eye at the Gao-8 and compare it to a Volkswagen Beetle. What you see is the gun itself, on the left, which is 112.28 inches long, attached to the ammunition feed assembly, bringing the total length to 19 feet 10 and a half inches. The barrels are 90.5 inches long and are chambered for the 30 by 173 millimeter cannon round. The total weight without ammunition is 620 pounds fully loaded. The gun and ammunition weigh around 3,968 pounds. This is not your weapon of choice for concealed carry. The design is based on that of the 19th century Gatling gun. There are seven barrels mounted around the periphery of a cylinder. While the original Gatling gun was hand cranked, the Gao 8's barrel cylinder is rotated by two hydraulic motors. As the cylinder rotates, each barrel is loaded, fired, unloaded, and reloaded in sequence by a system of cams. The recoil and gas from rounds fired play no part in the operation of the gun. This means that a misfire does not affect the firing of subsequent rounds. There are three versions of this round, PGU-13B High Explosive Incendiary, which provides fragmentation and incendiary effects for use against personnel, trucks, ammunition storage, and various other targets, PGU-14B Armor Piercing Incendiary, featuring a high-density penetrator for excellent armor penetration capability and post-armor effects against tanks and armored personnel carriers, and PGU-15B Target Practice, a ballistically matched low-cost cartridge designed for training purposes. The ballistic performance of the three types of ammunition is almost identical. The muzzle velocity of the armor-piercing incendiary round is 1,013 meters per second, with a projectile mass of 395 grams, resulting in a muzzle energy of around 203,000 joules. <laughs> this is approximately 10 times the energy of the 50 BMG round, which is generally considered rather powerful, and more than 100 times that of the 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge fired by the M16 and its variant. If one of these is coming your way, hiding behind a car won't save you, nor will hiding behind a tank. But the whole point of the Gal 8 is that there's never just one round coming your way. As each barrel rotates to the 9 o'clock position as seen from the front, it fires, and rounds are discharged as rapidly as the barrel cylinder spins. When the trigger's initially pulled and the barrel spins up, it fires about 50 rounds in the first second, then 65 rounds per second thereafter. The sustained rate of fire is 3,900 rounds per minute, or 65 rounds per second. It doesn't sound like a machine gun. The rate of fire is so rapid, it's more like <laughs> Accuracy is specified as 80% of rounds falling within a cone 5 milliradians from the point of aim. At a range of 1,200 meters, 80% of rounds will hit within a 12-meter diameter circle. The Gao-8 is carried by the A-10 Thunderbolt II Close Air Support Aircraft, better known by its nickname, Warthog. Well, not so much carried, it's more accurate to say that the A-10 was built around the gun. The gun accounts for 16% of the plane's weight. Its installed offset to the right is viewed from the front, so the firing barrel will be aligned with the center line of the plane as it fires. The A-10 is the only aircraft to use the Gao-8. It was designed into the Dutch goalkeeper Sea Wiz shipboard defense system, which is deployed by the navies of eight countries. Despite the power of the gun and the A-10's combat-proven effectiveness, the Air Force tried to retire the airplane, and it wanted to trim the numbers ASAP. Recently, the Air Force has transferred two A-10 Warthogs out of service and over to a boneyard at Arizona's Davis-Monthan Air Force Base. The retirements mark just the beginning. The 355th wing intends to retire its entire A-10 squadron before the end of the calendar year. 
The U.S. Air Force wants to replace the Warthogs with more advanced fighter jets before 2030. The Davis Monthan fleet of A-10s counts 76 airframes in three distinct squadrons, all of which will be disbanded. A-10 pilots will be transferred to different units with different airframes. The A-10 has been the symbol of Davis Monthan Air Force Base for many years, said 355th Wing Commander Colonel Scott Mills, and it'll continue to be a symbol for the airmen, a symbol of their commitment, excellence, and service. Those retirements brought the total A-10 inventory from 281 down to 260. The service has divested five of the aircraft so far in fiscal 2024, Air Force Times reported, and plans to reduce its stock of Warthogs to 218 by the end of the year. 36 of the retirees will come from davis Monthan. the rest will come from Moody Air Force Base in Georgia. Clearly, the end of the A-10 service life is near. Debate over retiring the A-10 raged through successive presidential administrations. The attack jet, first flown in the 1970s, was objectively outdated, but it still performed its core function, close air support, so effectively and so cheaply that advocates were able to postpone the A-10's retirement for a number of years. As the U.S. pivots its attention toward rival nations with modern radar systems, the non-stealth A-10 starts to seem out of place in the contemporary Air Force, yet it'll be remembered as the best close air support jet in the history of aviation. The A-10 was developed at the peak of the Cold War when the U.S. was engaged in a passive power competition with the Peer State. Congress was willing to bankroll a robust defense budget, one that included airframes narrowly tailored to perform a specific function. Today, airframes are designed with a cost-conscious public and Congress in mind. They need to perform a variety of functions to make them cost-effective. Just like the F-35 and the F-A-18 can do a little bit of everything, they may not be perfectly tailored for any given role, but they can perform sufficiently across a broad spectrum of missions. During the Cold War, however, designers had the backing to build a jet that did one thing very, very well. The result was an inventory full of dazzling aircraft, each of which performed one mission. It was inefficient and expensive, but many of the jets were outstanding in performing the sole function of their design. The SR-71 was a supersonic marvel capable of only surveillance and reconnaissance. The original F-15, undefeated in aerial combat, was built without a pound for ground. The Workhorse A-6, built especially for bad weather and nighttime bombing, and the A-10 was designed to provide better close air support than any other aircraft ever. Built by Fairchild Republic, the A-10 is a modified version of the Douglas A-1 Sky Raider. The A-10 was built with two engines placed above the jet's straight wings. The engine placement was strategic, offering better protection from ground fire, as was the straight wing design, which provided better control at lower speeds. But the A-10, while brilliantly suited for conflict in the plains of Eastern Europe or the deserts of the Middle East against adversaries with outdated air defense systems, is poorly suited for a modern conflict against China. The A-10 lacks the stealth or speed to survive in contested airspace against an advanced enemy. Accordingly, as the U.S. pivots its attention toward the Indo-Pacific, the A-10 will be retired despite its venerable performance history. This jet had a little bit of everything. She's very spicy. To be the dedicated crew chief of the 74 flagship uh, means the world to me. I've been at this base in this unit for almost seven years now. Um, and it's not very often that you have a senior airman on a, a DCC flagship, but they've entrusted in me and I've made a name for myself through my work ethic. The flagship is passed down from each commander of the 74th fighter squadron. Uh, so we go through a whole change of command ceremony. As soon as they pass everything off, we pull off the name tape. We also change the door art. We're probably going to put ours within the squadron so that way everybody will always remember 674. My duties as a dedicated crew chief, we are responsible for essentially everything on the aircraft minus the computer systems and the weapon systems. Our main responsibility for when a pilot steps is us making sure that that aircraft is airworthy for him to come back home safe. If this A-10 could talk, honestly, it would probably tell us how good of a time it's had in its career. Uh, this aircraft's been on many 
combat deployments. It's been all over the world. This jet's seen a little bit of everything. Um, this jet flies weekly. I hope that uh, anyone that goes to see the Boneyard, they do take the time to go by and see this jet. You will notice this jet. It's hard to miss. To be able to be the DCC on the flagship is absolutely awesome, and it hits a lot closer to home seeing it go.